everybody. I've sometimes joked over the past year that potlucks might be the single biggest collective act of faith that we've taken at UUCC. We set a date, people bring food, and nobody goes away hungry. Well, now we're going to take a really big leap of faith, and we're counting on you. We're going to start our annual stewardship campaign as scheduled during this really difficult time. Pledge cards will be mailed the week of March 22nd. Along with the pledge cards, there will be a letter about how the 2020 Stewardship Campaign supports the mission and operations of our beloved community. We are asking members and friends who are able to increase their 2019 pledge by 7% for this upcoming congregation year. If unable, we are asking that you hold steady with your current commitment. If you are uncertain what you can commit to at this time, let us know and we will reach out to you later. We encourage you to be as generous as you can and are grateful for pledge commitments that can be made now. We recognize that this is a time of uncertainty. Hold on to your pledge card for as long as you need and thank you. If you did not make a pledge last year, the suggested amount is $2,300. If every pledge unit, either individual or family, in our congregation donated this amount, we would make our goal of $500,000. Although, of course, any pledge amount is appreciated. If you're able, we'd like to have you consider a major gift of $3,500 or a family major gift of $5,000. Please fill out your pledge card and send it back promptly in the envelope provided in the mailing. If you are going to set up quarterly or monthly payments, please let us know what to expect with a note on the pledge card. If you can, send your check in with your pledge card. Our stewardship campaign will wrap up on April 19th. Our optimistic plan is to have a celebratory brunch after services provided by Harry's Kitchen Crew. So look for the mailing from UUCC. Tear open the envelope with enthusiasm. Pull out the letter, read your pledge card, fill out your pledge card, tuck it back in the envelope, and send it off to UUCC. And then give yourself a big hug out of gratitude and for knowing that you did the right thing. We're grateful for your ongoing generosity and support. We have faith that you're going to continue to support your congregation as we all look beyond this time apart. Thank you. As I light our shared chalice, please join me in singing Rise Up, O Flame. Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing, show to us beauty, mercy, and joy. Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing, show to us beauty, mercy and joy. Hi, I'm the Reverend Joe Cherry of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Cleveland. I'd like to welcome you to our digital worship this morning. Today you'll hear from Mike Carney, who's our director of music, and a story about his grandmother and great-grandmother. We'll hear from Dr. Ellen Georgia, a time for all ages. We're also gonna hear from the Reverend Dr. Rena Shear, who's our community minister, and I also a message. We hope that you will find something both challenging to your intellect and warming to your heart here today. We hope that you'll find our digital presentation to be valuable with your time and that you'll find it rewarding. So without further ado, welcome to worship.
Please join us in our unison reading. I, I do, do not, not ask for this faith because, because I shrink, shrink from paying the great debt of nature, but I but ask for it that I may have respect for myself, myself, that I may feel life is worth living, that good, good is worth striving for above and beyond its mere return of earth. And, and above all else, I ask for that faith because it makes life grand and it gives to us sublime possibilities. And further, it gives a substance of joy and bliss which nothing earthly ever gave and which nothing of earth can take away. Dear and gentle people, this is your music director, Mike Carney, and I'd like to share a few words about beloved community and generational wisdom. Some of the words I'm sharing with you today are borrowed and adapted from UU minister Erica Hewitt, but this first part is from me. Some of you know that I was born into the UU faith, but many of you are not aware that my family has an association with this congregation that goes back for many years. The picture I'm sharing with you hangs in the hallway just outside my office door in our Shaker Heights building. It shows a gathering of RE students and teachers on the steps of the 82nd Street Church in 1922. Look closely at that young girl in the lower left, sitting at the end of the front row. That girl's name is Ellen Anna, and she was my grandmother. If that seems incredible, listen to this. On the right side of the photo is a woman wearing a truly impressive hat. Two people to her right is a man standing with his arms folded. And over his right shoulder is my great-grandmother, Marion Wildman. I never got to meet my great-grandmother in person, but now I feel very fortunate to have the opportunity to say hello to her every time I walk into my office. My great-grandmother was a Unitarian, she happened to live just a few blocks away from that church on 82nd Street. She attended regularly, and as you can see, she even volunteered to teach Sunday school. I don't say any of this with the intention of claiming special privilege or status, but only to make a point about the debt I owe, in fact, the debt we all owe, to our spiritual ancestors. Over 150 years ago, the mothers and fathers of this congregation saw a need for a progressive religious community in Cleveland. But their experience did not form in a void. Their spirituality was informed by shared ancestors who spoke words centuries ago that still ring true today. The communion of churches is exercised by way of mutual care in taking thought for one another's welfare, in case of need to minister relief and succor unto one another. We may not be under the same roof today, but we are all of one family in faith. We affirm the shared ministry that we are all a part of today. We offer to each other care and succor. We commit to taking thought of each other's welfare as individuals and as a congregation. We call upon one another for all of this, for we have promised each other that we will be a beloved community. We have found that there is always more to learn about how love really works and could work in our lives and around the world.
Well, good morning, class. Or, wait, shoot, this isn't class. This is worship. As you can tell, I'm fraying a bit. The quarantine is getting to me. I'm sorry. I've noticed, actually, uh, that the number of runners in my neighborhood has gone up like crazy. So many people just out there blowing off steam, getting out into the world, running. As someone who has never in my life experienced the urge to run, I'm very impressed by all of them. For me, the reality is, in my deepest bones, what I really am, obviously not a runner, is a teacher. And the simple fact is I actually have been out of class now for a month. Because before we were asked to all stay in our homes, I was actually on spring break for really like the two weeks before that. So now, weirdly, I've been out of my classrooms for like a very, very long time. And just like those runners outside, I am itching to get back in the classroom. Like it's, it's bad. The other day I found myself just sharpening pencils for no reason. I just liked the smell of wood and pencil lead. And it's been weeks since I'm in front of students. So I'm really sorry to do this to all of you. But this morning, I have to take you to school. And when I spoke with Reverend Joe and Mike Carney about this morning, I learned we were talking about the theme, Why Church? I thought that a good thing to talk about was actually the word church itself. Because I think it's a word that gets misunderstood a little bit. And uh, especially for you use who I think for good reasons, you know, want to uh, separate themselves from the way the word is used among Christian congregations. I'm going to suggest that actually there is a heritage to that word that's actually very appropriate and specifically meaningful to how you use organize themselves. But I have to start with a little mini story by noting that my brother's name is Kirk. Now, I don't know if any of you either have weird names in your in your families or, or come from families who like weird names, but Kirk is a weird name. And I know it's a weird name because when I was a young kid, of course, Kirk was just my brother. That was just a name I was familiar with. But then when I got to school, I met like seven Christophers and like four Johns. And I realized that as a name for a boy, Kirk was, was unusual. And now that we have Google to help us, I can actually give you facts and figures. And I can tell you that since the year 1880, of the millions upon millions of Americans born, only 65,000 were named Kirk. This is a very uncommon name. So when I realized how uncommon it was, I was a curious kid. I was curious to find out what this word meant. So when I looked it up in uh, a, an etymology dictionary, I learned that the name didn't even come from, but it literally just means church. In fact, Kirk is simply the Northern English and Scottish word used for churches everywhere. So that was kind of interesting to learn. Um, but then I, I looked a bit deeper and I realized that actually it comes from an ancient Greek root, which makes sense because that's where early Christian groups were, were, um, were speaking was ancient Greek. Except in ancient Greek, they actually didn't use the term that later became Kirk. They used a different word. And that word was ekklesia. Now that sounded a bit more familiar to me because I knew that that was a word that was sometimes used to talk about churches and a word like ecclesiastical or something like that. So I understood where the name came from. No idea how my family got this name, but that's at least where it was from. But there's more to this story. Because ecclesia is not a Christian word at all. In fact, it's a word that really comes out of the most socially progressive part of the ancient world. And specifically, it was essential as an element of the form of democracy first used in ancient Athens. And this is where the sense of the word becomes really interesting and important. Because Athens is actually not democratic the way we think about democracy in America. Because we think about ourselves as democratic, but really what we are is representatively democratic. We are put in a position where we get to vote for the people who are going to be our leaders. But in ancient Athens, actually, every Athenian household was allowed to vote on every city issue, much like UU churches. Now, I do have to note, they, they never really got to women's voting, and I'm sorry to say that they weren't uh, advanced enough to really get to gender equality sort of in the 6th century BCE, but to give them some credit, they were actually one of the only groups in really all of history that even allowed the lowest, like, serf classes to vote, which is really saying something considering the time period we're talking about. So, Ecclesia was literally a name for those who were called together. 
Ek is a, actually the Greek preposition. It means from or like out of. And uh, ecclesia comes from the Greek word kaleo, which means to call out. So those who were would make up the ecclesia were those who were gathered together to vote on policies for the city. They would nominate and approve leaders and counselors. They would even collectively vote about like big events in the city's life and decide whether or not they would uh, build a certain building or go to war or something like that. So the reality is actually that our church is a concept um, very close to how you use work together. It's really wrapped up in our fourth principle about the democratic process, and it describes the way that we've all been called together and crucially how we've all responded to that call. It's because all of you are here because you signed up at some point and said, yes, I will be here and I will add my voice. And that's a pretty powerful thing to hold on to. Okay. That's better. Got a little teaching out of my system. Uh, this is hard because, of course, I can't see any of your faces, but I do know that you're all out there. And to kind of wrap this entire thing up, I'll say that even though we are now all separated from one another as an ecclesia, I know that the time is, in fact, coming when we will all emerge out of our homes and gather together once again, lift our voices as one, and uh, respond to that call once again. And all I can say is that uh, I very much look forward to that day. Greetings from the Cleveland VA Medical Center. This is Reverend Rena, your community minister, and I will be talking about the spirituality of washing our hands today. But first, I want to introduce one of my colleagues and someone who's probably familiar to you as well. Hi, I'm Michelle. I preached at your church once. This is Michelle Ma. She is right right in the middle of her one-year residency training here at the VA, and she is going to be the person behind the camera for most of this video. So first, I want to make sure my hands are sanitized before I do anything in the VA, especially right now in the midst of COVID-19. This is our All Faiths Chapel. This is a space that is open 24-7 for our veterans, staff, and any family of our patients. So let's come in. I consider this chapel the heartbeat of the hospital. It's right smack in the middle of the medical center, and it is a very quiet and a very sacred space. This is where we hold Mass, Monday through Friday, and on Sundays, we also hold a special Protestant worship service. We have a lot of special worship services here as well throughout the year, and we have several memorial services here. And every year on Valentine's Day, we actually have a renewal of vows ceremony that is usually a, really probably one of the most joyful experiences that we'll have in the sanctuary. One of the reasons why I wanted to show you this is because in my workplace, sacred spaces and washing of hands really go together. And we've heard so much about the importance of hand washing in the last few weeks with the coronavirus. And also, we're in a hospital setting. And thinking about hand washing makes me, it, well, I remember my children when they were little and teaching them how to sing Old MacDonald Had a Farm to make sure that they were scrubbing up for at least 20 seconds. But also in the hospital, when I first started my internship here, I remember the importance of making sure that I sanitized my hand every time I went into a veteran's room. Those little Purell machines are all over the hospital, right next to every single bedroom. I also remember one of our chaplains who was who, was, who would come and um, help, help us learn, saying that for him, stopping for that moment, making sure that his hands were clean, was a very spiritual moment. It helped him purify himself, it gave him a chance to catch his breath, and it just made the moment a little more sacred before he would go into that room. So I'd like to show you another place where we can wash our hands here. We are now going to be entering the sacristy. This is where we have 
all of our worship supplies. It's where we have all of our different vestments. It's where our sound system is for all of our worship services. And we also have another sink in here just to make sure that we have every opportunity that we can, especially when we're offering sacraments, to make sure that everything is germ-free and really clean for our veterans. So we all know, we've all been hearing that we're supposed to soap up and wash for at least 20 seconds. And that can seem like drudgery sometimes. What I've been practicing is singing not Happy Birthday or Old MacDonald Had a, far a Farm, but I've been singing one of our wonderful hymns, Meditation on Breathing, when I wash my hands. And I'm very lucky today that Michelle is here and she is going to be singing it with me. So the first step for really good hand washing is to make sure the water is nice and hot. So you've got a lot of hot water, you get plenty of soap, and then you start singing. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. And then, of course, when you're done, you use a paper towel, not your hand, to turn off the water. That's an old rule from preschool that some of you may remember. I hope that you have enjoyed this short meditation on breathing, and both Michelle and I hope that you stay safe and that you continue to feel really connected to all of us around, the, around Cleveland. Have a great day. Please join in our unison reading. It, it may be thought that in our church, church we, we sometimes, sometimes spoke lightly of what other churches held dear. We, we were not irreverent in our hearts, and we, we never meant to sin against the Holy Spirit. Spirit. The, the mission of the Universalist, Universalist Church was to free minds from the cruel prisons of dread and fear, and, and to help them to understand that God and life are kinder than they supposed.
reading from the Global Scripture today is called Nobody Needs a Church or Lament of the Ministers by Reverend Sharon Wiley. I'm spiritual but not religious, they say, and I'm not comfortable with institutionalized religion. That's all well and good. But I get phone calls from strangers hoping I'll visit a dying father and emails from strangers requesting prayers. I've seen people crying in the grocery store and the mall parking lot. I consider stepping in, but people say they don't want ministers these days, and I already have congregants I never visit. My heart is a wellspring of grief for all I cannot do and all I cannot serve. And saying no sometimes is the only way I can be sure that I can say yes when I need to. I'm homebound, they say, and I'm lonely. Nobody wants a minister until suddenly they do. And nobody wants a church until a loved one is dying or dead. And suddenly it would be nice to have someone give the eulogy and people to bring the casseroles and friends to sit and cry with. We need roving gangs of chaplains patrolling the streets, accompanying the grieving and witnessing the suffering, answering 24-hour hotlines and churches staffed with ministers to spare. But I'm spiritual but not religious, they say, and I'm not comfortable with institutionalized religion. There's little funding for we ministers, we guides, we who companion and mirror and witness the world's pain and suffering and joy. And so we companion and mirror and witness pain and suffering and joy. We see the hurting and the yearning and confusion. Where can I find people to connect with, they ask, and who can I talk to about my grief? Who will visit my dying father? And who will pray for me? I know the answers to these questions, uneasy answers. It's hard to make withdrawals when you've made no deposits and that which we do not nurture dies. Good morning. I chose the reading that Peggy read earlier um, the minister's lament months ago. Denis um, used it at his church in the fall, and I thought it'd be perfect for us as we launch into stewardship because the question of why do we need what we're doing? Why does it matter? Why does it matter to us? Why? What makes it so important um, was interesting, and it wasn't really clearly my intention for us to be so isolated from each other now. And so this becomes more than just the minister's lament. It becomes our lament. It's true there's always more work that needs to be done than can be done by any one person. And there's um, now I think more than ever, the question, the need to gather, the, the desire to gather, the a recognition of how important it is to gather when I read the line about who will bring the casseroles and who will I mourn with again this morning, as opposed to several months ago when I planned the service, it feels more pointed now, more real now in a way. And the poem is moved from a lament of a minister who walks through the world like I do, trying to figure out how to um, be present, be helpful, be attentive, to be careful, to be caring, and not, and yet also not too present, too caring, too in the way. Um, it's a whole new world now, at least for now. And this made me ask the question, why church? Why do we do church? Which you know, it's part of why I think how I think about stewardship. Like, why do we do church? Why do we come together? Um, we come together because it's what people do. People have been doing this 
all along. In fact, it's part of what I think makes people people. And um, right now, we're starting our stewardship time together, which is when we find a way to pledge um, our work and our resources to the functioning of our congregation. It's the, it's the way that we keep our covenant. It's how we work together to say, I am here with you. I know that we are responsible for the upkeep of this nonprofit institution that we have bills to pay and programs that we enjoy. And this is a space, this allows us to have a space where we gather week after week we come together for things like coffee hour, which now seems so much more precious to me than ever before. The pledge is sometimes, the stewardship is sometimes an awkward time to be the minister because you don't want to be seen as like begging for your own income. And that's not what this is about. I think... I keep seeing online now that we are learning that, that congregational life is more than the building. The church, the community is not the building. We are the people. And your pledge for the support of the congregation in however way you're able to next year, it's called a pledge. It's a promise to work together, to supply each other with what we need. Next year is a big year. Next year you're talking about who the minister will be in the future. Next year, you're finishing working on so many projects begun three years ago. Next year, we're going to need each other to be engaged, to show up. And part of that process is pledging. Pledging is not a begging for money, but rather a, a request to let us know the, what we'll have to work with. The folks in the stewardship team are working hard to get the pledges in so that the finance team knows how much, how many resources we have to do the work for next year, which affects the board and the staff and the strategic planning committee. So I'm gonna ask you to, when you get your pledge card in the mail, to think about what you can do and return it quickly because what you're doing by returning the pledge card quickly is helping the congregation plan for the next year. So we know what we're doing. In a world that feels so uncertain right now, helping us as a system do a little planning is a little bit of normalcy. So why church? Why the lament? Why? Because they matter deeply to us. We are the people who show up who do the work, who come together. Even when I was a layperson in my 20s in Chicago, I showed up. I pledged not much money then, and often I pledged just enough. Well, basically, I pledged my tax return every year because that's when I had extra money. Um, I moved a lot of chairs. I was on a lot of committees. I did a lot of work because I knew I could do that when I couldn't write a big check. So it isn't even a big check we're looking for. We're looking for a promise that you will individually and do the best you can so that collectively we can enrich the world. And this is tied in part to Reverend Wiley's lament. I, can, I can't do everything. There are people in need. There are people in the mall, in the grocery store, who I want to help. And sometimes I can say yes, and sometimes... I have to say no so that I can help the people that we're already in relationship with. I guard the minister's discretionary fund carefully. I do help people, and whenever I spend money from that fund, I report it to the board, never to whom, but I report how much I gave out and the reason, so like groceries or rent help or utilities. I, I take that responsibility very seriously. But if I said yes to every person who ever asked me for financial help, I wouldn't have the resources for those who need help in the future. 
In the same way, the pledge is about the help we offer each other collectively, where there are committees in charge of all that money and all that planning. And it's an act of trust to say, I pledge this because I trust our system, I trust our people, and you can trust me to show up and do what I'm able to do. And right now, that feels especially salient, especially important to say, I promise that in the future, when we're still working either through this or some new adventure or returning to some of these services, you can count on me. I will show up. I will be here. I'll do my best. I can tell you that now. I will do my best. I will show up. I'll return my pledge card. I hope that you will also. I hope that you also can see this not only as an administrative sort of discussion I'm having with you, but really a chance to practice your spirituality, to sit and think about what matters deeply to you and how you can help support the institution that matters to you, that feeds you, that you go to, except for now, that you can go to and return to in times of trouble, in times of crisis, in times of joy. This is what we're promising each other during the stewardship. I hope that you will seriously consider my request that you return your pledge cards in a timely manner so that we can get on the business of getting back to normal. Um, I'm here in my mom's backyard today, still wishing we were together, still wishing I was able to see you all face to face, hopefully soon. Until then, take care, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for spending this time with us today. I hope in our service you found something that challenged your intellect, that emboldened your heart, that made you understand that you're not alone, that gave you some tools to face the week ahead. Thanks again for spending time with us. Look forward to seeing you soon. Take care of yourselves.